I really learned that going out, meeting people, being a connector, networking, and learning from other people was possibly one of the biggest lessons that I learned in technology, that even in a field that may be furthest removed from networking, that it still makes a difference. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the journey to multifamily millions. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Zana Investments, Tim Little. And on today's show, we have with us George Roberts III. George is a founder of Walnut Grove Homes, an upscale residential construction company based in Troy, Michigan, which reached seven-figure status in 2021. He is also a principal at Horizon Multifamily, which sponsors value-add multifamily opportunities in the Southeast for qualified passive investors. In addition to his over 300 units as an active multifamily investor, he is also an avid passive investor. His passive investments include over 500 multifamily units, as well as car washes, various early stage companies, and a drug rehab facility. George, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Tim. Yeah, and it's great to have you. So I gave everyone a high level overview of your background. But on this show, we really like to get into the details of how you got started on your journey to multifamily millions. So please take us back to the beginning and tell us how you got to where you are today, because I think some people are going to be a little surprised by your background. Okay, if we're going to talk about the surprising things, I imagine we're going to go all the way back to the very get-go. I was a bioscientist. We're in the depths of the Great Recession, decided to become an accidental landlord. So we kept the family residence just turned it into a rental, bought a new house, bought it in 2010, so we could hardly have timed it any better than that. And that was my entree into real estate investing, just tipping my toe into the water, really wasn't ready to dive in just yet, was focused on tech. From there I went, I became an award-winning bioscientist, spent a few years there, got to learn finance and some new data analytic skills, which were very helpful to me later on. But along the way, what really changed my course was that my sister said to me one day, let's start a construction company. And it was from there that really ignited the fire of entrepreneurship. If you've seen my podcast, it's the founder of Leaders are Forged Daily. The metaphor is the fire of entrepreneurship. And once I was exposed to that world, I thought, wow, I thought it was an academic guy who just wanted to go into the business world but it was much deeper than that. I wanted to run my own business. So I did help her launch that company. We're doing really well. We're building a dozen residential units in Troy, Michigan. Beautiful project. We're about to stick a shovel in the ground for the last three. And it's amazing from seeing plans to the streets and the utilities, and then seeing the houses go up to see cars on the street. That whole experience, it literally changed my life. So I said, look, I want to have a business of my own. And what would that be? I still have a six figure plus job. So I know I'm not going to start a construction company. It's got to be something that I can be a little bit more passive, went into value add multifamily. So I've been doing that for at least a couple years, two and a half years, working on three now and did a lot along the way, did joint ventures, done syndication, and just love it. I think it's a great place to be if you understand finance, if you understand real estate. Real estate syndication is an awesome opportunity. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. I'm interested in some of the things you talked about there. So you started off as that accidental landlord. What did that look like? I assume it was the home that you were living in and then maybe you moved. And if so, were you the, were you self-managing or did you hand that off to a property manager? We self-managed and to be quite honest at the time, we didn't really run it like a business. The easiest way to get great tenants is just to have somewhat below market rent. We had the perfect tenants. The guy was a groundskeeper and a handyman. And so he asked me just once to fix something and he apologized too. And <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, man. I don't know how to fix this. At the time, I was just noticing that, wow, this is really cool. This roughly passive income, it depends once you set it up, finding the deal, financing the deal, screening your tenants. But wow, once you set it up, it can be pretty passive. And it was an amazing experience. Yeah. And I think that's obviously how so many people get started in real estate. 
in the first place, right? Is oh, I moved from one house to another. No, what am I going to do with this house? Maybe I don't want to sell it. So let's just rent it out. And it's more of an experiment for most people. Yeah. But then they find, hey, I'm able to make a couple hundred bucks a month from this. And someone else is paying my mortgage and providing me equity. So that's when the light bulb goes off, I think, for a lot of people. Either that or they have a terrible experience and they never do it again. Well, I was going to say, if you had mentioned it, <laughs> that what I hear from so many of my friends who went into landlording, that it was great until I got a bad tenant and that was it. Done. But what people don't realize is that there are ways around that. You can either manage it as a true business, learn how to screen your tenants, or hand it over to professional property management. But then again, that usually makes more sense for multifamily because, hey, you're giving them a much better deal by giving them a whole bunch of units in one place and they give you a better deal as well. Yeah, and exactly. When you talk about multifamily, you start to get those economies of scale. And anyone who's held single family property knows that generally speaking, the going rate is about 10% of all rents go to that property manager. But as you start to scale up eight unit, 10 unit, 100 unit, that percentage starts to go down, right? Because it's not just one person. They have teams that are able to handle these things and they have the infrastructure there to more effectively and efficiently manage the properties. Right. So just to put a big bow on it, at that point, I decided, hey, not only am I going to go into business for myself, I already understand what it's like to be a landlord. So now let's run it like a business this time and let's do it at scale. Yeah. And you're right. I think the area where like people languish is they never get around to running it like a business. And so it just chugs along slowly and not very effectively. So I wanted to ask you, you talked about your sister saying, hey, let's start a construction company. In terms of entrepreneurialism and thinking up a business, it wouldn't be the first one that I would think of. So did either one of you have a background in that? And if not, then how did you guys land on that? Right. We inherited some land from my father. It was his dream to do this. 2008 came along and it just didn't make any sense at all for him to go through it. He never really got the opportunity to do that. Come 2015, we, we had a decision to make. Those of you out there in real estate, a lot of good deals come to people because they say, hey, we have this land. We don't know what to do with it. We have this property. We don't want to manage it. We don't even live in the States. And that's the sort of decision you have. We decided, okay, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to make this dream a reality. And so we did. Oh, that's awesome. And so I, I guess when she came to you with that idea, was this kind of fleshed out already? Did, was there a business plan in place or were you like, just, let's just figure it out? It was a lot more, let's figure it out. And I should probably mention my brother-in-law at this point. She said, you know what, let's do this. And you know what, my husband... He can, he can be the builder. He'll get the license. And she knew finance. I was in fintech and I had a tech background, et cetera. So it seemed all together. We have the capital to do this. We have the land. We have the dream. Of course, we had to rewrite the plans. And we're talking about almost a decade on since the original plans were written up. And let's just do it. Let's figure it out. But I got to say, I think that's really how businesses are founded. The business plan comes later. You have the passion, you have the idea, that spark, and then it's, okay, we're really doing this. Let's write up the business plan. Yeah, and I think that's going back to that spark of entrepreneurialism that you talked about. That's a big part of it is saying, okay, I have the idea, I have the spark. Now, how am I going to do this? And that's when you start digging into it, doing the research, figuring out what's required. And I think the interesting thing about entrepreneurialism is sometimes you need to be in the right place in the right time to really capitalize on that spark. I think I found that spark at different points in my life, but it wasn't the right time for it to catch fire, right? Eighth grade selling candy that I bought at the wholesale store and getting shut down by the teacher. Okay, that probably wasn't the right time. And later on, getting introduced to, to real estate right before the bubble burst, and thankful that I didn't get going right then. But then having it come along one more time when I was in the right place, had the capital, the education, and the people around me to actually put it into motion. And I think that's so important. Right. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. Exactly. Exactly. And it's just funny when it, it comes up in your own life and you're like, oh, I get it now. Yeah, it makes sense.
All right. So a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. We're talking about syndication here. And I think a lot of people have never even heard of syndication. I know I hadn't until I did, let alone done a deal. Once you're in this bubble that we're in, it feels like everybody is a multifamily syndicator. And it's clearly not the case, but but what do you think is the best way for some of these deal sponsors and people like you to differentiate yourself from what feels like a very crowded field? Right. Awesome. First, I think you're asking me, what is syndication? So my definition is just two or more investors coming together to make an investment that neither could make on their own. And to take that a little further, so you're going to have somebody running the deal and they're going to be your general partners and someone else is coming in passively. The nice thing about that is that they're going to be shielded completely from the legal and the financial. At that point, all you can lose is your initial investment. That may sound like a lot, but if you invest in the stock market, same thing can happen. So it's a great way to get started in real estate, great way to get started in commercial real estate, because as a passive investor, you're still going to have to do a lot of work to vet your sponsor, vet the deal, vet the market, et cetera. But once you do that, once you've done that upfront work, just a stock that you might purchase, you just sit back and you wait for your dividend. Yeah. And I, I think something that you mentioned is really important to understand. We have to be careful never to oversell any investment. And you're absolutely right. All investments have risk, right? But I think it's also true that not all that risk is created equal. There's a very big difference between jumping into some obscure Bitcoin. Or, or there's some, some other... coins we can't even mention on the air. <laughs> yeah. There's a big difference between that and our real property that you can see in touch. Well, absolutely. If you're doing it right, you're leveraging properly, you have appropriate reserves, then it's not really something you can lose. Now, those elements may or may not be possible or present in your deal. And so people do lose real estate. You can lose money. It is possible. But again, when it's done right, and again, that's with proper reserves, buying right, managing it right, it's very hard to lose money in this business. <clears throat> yeah. And that, the other point that I wanted to mention was the passivity. We talked about before being a landlord, managing yourself. What's very different about this is that people, they have to do work up front. I'm not going to say that right. it's completely passive because you have an ultimate responsibility to know and understand where your money is in being is being invested. But at the same time, after that, it, it's really set it, forget it in the sense that you don't have an active role. You should certainly be looking at every monthly or quarterly update that you're getting on that property that you're investing in and then asking follow-up questions if you have concerns. And I think a lot of investors don't bother to ask questions. There's a lot of trust in the sponsors, and that's good. But at the same time, if you're curious or you have concerns, by all means, ask questions. You have the right to do so by virtue of the fact that you've invested your money. Right. And when you meet your sponsor the first time, if you're meeting through the internet, that's a great time to judge whether this is somebody who's going to help me learn whether or not that's something you're looking for. So if you're new to commercial real estate and you say, hey, this deal makes sense. I like this sponsor. And they're not really answering your questions. I got news for you. It's going to get worse after you write the check. On the other hand, if you find somebody who's personable or even ideally it's somebody in your social network, somebody who trust, then it can be a great learning experience. And I learned from every one of my passive deals. In fact, large portion of the reason why I do invest in a passive deal or as a co-GP is only if I feel like I'm getting into something new. So I'm not going to do a drug rehab facility. Maybe I'll do a triple net someday. But look, I had the opportunity to watch this thing and see what sort of, I don't want to say mistakes are made along the way, but I, let's just say that if you do any sort of construction or redevelopment, the city's going to throw a couple of curveballs at you. And to watch that and watch it through an experienced an experienced operator's eyes is a lot easier. You don't have to catch all those curveballs, right? But you're going to see how they handle that and you get to learn a lot. So it's a great experience. Yeah. And that's a great point that I hadn't really thought about that much, right? I have my niche, which is value add multifamily. And I think I passively invest as well. And I look at it more as a diversification play. But you're absolutely right in terms of the education. Hey, I may think about going into mobile home parks and a lot of aspects of it makes sense to me. 
but I'm just not comfortable yet based on my lack of knowledge in raising for that type of deal or taking down that type of deal myself. But by passively investing in a deal like that, I could get a full on education on both the good sides and the bad sides of how that works. And like you said, how an experienced operator handles any challenges that might be thrown at them. That's such a good point for us as active investors as well to learn other, other asset classes. Absolutely. Now, I didn't mean to evade your question about differentiating myself. And I think I take differentiating diversification and tie it all together. So one of the ways that I'm trying to differentiate myself, I came from a tech background. So I realized that, look, things are getting very crowded here in multifamily. I remember you saying earlier in the interview that it seems like if you're in this group, everybody's a syndicator, everybody's in multifamily, but it is a pretty small fishbowl, but it's growing fast. And we know that we can't really outgrow the dimensions of the fishbowl. So as we see things getting way overcrowded, and as we see interest rates rising and a lot of economic turmoil perhaps coming our way, I think the thing to do is you really need to understand macroeconomics. So taking my background, I've been a teacher, I've been a bioscientist, I've been an award-winning data scientist. I can see what people are missing, in my opinion, in this field. And that is a lack of understanding of either finance or macroeconomics. I want to take that, make it simple, make it digestible, and help people understand how does this relate to your business? And as far as diversification, as we do see this is a crowded field and that students are being churned out, turned out in ever increasing numbers. This is one of the reasons why I do occasionally do a co-GP deal or I go out and I am an LP because I think that if you are just doing straight up multifamily and you don't understand any other niche, say Litech, for example, what are you gonna do when the next crop of students comes on the scene and it's harder than ever to find the deals and you don't want to be in a situation where you get froze out. So I'm looking for other niches. I'm looking for ways to protect my investors and I'm looking for potentially a less crowded field. That's why I came here in the first place. We over a decade of extraordinarily low and stable interest rates. We saw prices come from a level that we probably wouldn't have seen had it not been for the financial crisis, we've had a building crisis. Builders are just not building and they really haven't come back. I think we've only had one month where we had above 1.5 million completions since 2006. And guess what? It went right back down after that. So we had this perfect storm that's just brought people in, I hate to say like locusts, into our field. And I think that you're really going to have to be smart to get through the next level. So I say differentiate yourself and diversify your portfolio. Yeah, and I share a lot of your sentiment, especially when it comes to people needing to understand that macroeconomic environment. My educational background anyways, is a master's in global trade and an international MBA. So I was knee deep in that stuff for a while, but I've held on to it because I understand that it's important and that things that are happening elsewhere could have an impact on what's happening here. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't think about it or they don't care or they're just not willing to do the, the research to connect the dots. And I get that, right? Everybody's yeah. busy. But if people like you or me are into that, and we, we actually enjoy reading articles that kind of shed some light on that stuff, then it's not so much of a chore for us to share that with our right. audience. I love your background. If you don't mind, I'll mention a couple really quickly. I do like to take a comparative or geographic approach to everything. I think it's a great start. If you look at Japan and what they've done since the 1980s, some of their innovations in banking are things that we picked up on maybe 20 years later. But guess what? Didn't turn out well for Japan. So no. understand history, understand banking, understand geography. And if you want to know what might be happening in our economic system, study Japan. If you're worried about the financialization of the world, and these are two things I was just talking to Chris Galizio about a couple hours ago on my podcast, and we were also talking about Iceland, right? Their economy became financialized to an absurd level. People leaving various occupations, everybody just literally going into finance because that's who was paying. And boom, that bubble collapsed really hard on the Icelanders. So you want to take a wider lens and it's not about shiny object syndrome or squirrels. The question is, how do you relate it back? So take that wide lens view, 
cast a wide net and then ask the question, okay, now what does this have to do with what I'm doing? I'm an investor. I'm running this business. What can I learn from these lessons that might help me to keep from stumbling? I guarantee that'll be the cheapest lesson you learn, something you learn from someone else's experience. Yeah. And then the thing about real estate is then we have to bring it really micro too, because you know every market can be different in terms of what it offers and what the fundamentals are within that perspective. Take Atlanta, for example. I like Atlanta. Okay. Why do I like it? Just because it's a big city and it's growing? No, because it has population growth. It has job growth. It has job diversity, which not enough people think about. I, when you have one, one employer or industry go down, you don't want that to cripple the entire area because guess what? Tenants who don't have jobs are tenants who can't pay rent. So Exactly. It's not the obvious things that bring you down. It's the black swan. So having diversification of employment, et cetera. Yeah. Great pick. A great metro. Yeah. And so this kind of goes into what you were talking about and your background. I'm always curious how people with different corporate backgrounds, the skills and experience that they've had in those jobs. So how did you parlay your background as a bioscientist and award-winning data scientist into success in commercial real estate? Most of it was the analytic end, as I just mentioned, but there are other things too. I also learned that it's very important to be social. So the first thing I heard when I was learning gene splicing is, hey, wait, I think somebody might have this plasmid that we're working with, so bacterial DNA, circular form, and said, hey, why don't we clone by phone? It turned out that we really couldn't borrow the DNA that we were looking for. We had to go out and we had to make it ourselves. But that was a huge lesson. And I realized that as much as it's important to go through stacks of journals and spend time in the laboratory, that when you're having trouble, just go down the hall and talk to somebody who's been making that sort of experiment work recently. That's That really stuck with me. So I ended up becoming, I think, a lot more social than most people with a technical background. Some people say, George, you're a PhD. You don't seem like a PhD. I make a point of not seeming like a PhD. <laughs> this is by design. And so I really learned that going out, meeting people, being a connector, networking, and learning from other people was possibly one of the biggest lessons that I learned in technology, that even in a field that may be furthest removed from networking, that it still makes a difference. So I did go out and learn to become a networker. I spent a lot of time. I've got multiple things I do every Wednesday at noon. You can come join me. We've got a networking call if you're in Michigan. I actually have not one, but two two in-person meetups. And sometimes I have events in the evening where I have speakers come in. So I have a lot of things going on. And what it's really done is it's revolutionized my business. So most people say, well, how do you buy an apartment? Okay. The stock answer is, well, underwrite a hundred apartments, find one that's good, and then take it to a sponsor. And that is a great way to go. I will not disparage that. But after going through and doing that, and then getting some experience and now becoming a real networker, and connector of people. I have people bringing deals to me all the time. I can't always look at all the things that are coming into me. So here, by the way, if you want to work with me, poke the bear, okay? If I don't get right back with you, certainly within 24, definitely within 48 hours, send me a text message because I got stuff coming in all the time. And a lot of times, all I can do is just connect people. I have to say, listen, I can't be part of your deal, but I know somebody who'd be awesome for you. Thank you for thinking of me. Perhaps you'll think of me in the future. Yeah. And I think one of the best ways that we can add value to someone is to connect them with the right people and yeah. being known as that connector. I'm curious, do you think there are any downsides to being a connector or is it all positive? Without a doubt. I think one of the most astute comments that I've heard, I believe it was Sandia Sashadri, who said, don't network, work. And <laughs> there's certainly two sides to the story. Now, I would be a natural for just sitting down with a spreadsheet. I love spreadsheets. In fact, when it comes to the finance, a lot of times I'm the one doing a lot of the modeling, but I don't always have the time to go through and do what I call primary underwriting. I do a lot of secondary underwriting. You bring me your deal. I'll take a look at it. I'll critique it. And I'll say, hey, I've got a few questions about this. Can you prove out these rents, et cetera? But that's the downside is that after having developed this part of me so much, and obviously my podcast, and here I'm coming on your podcast today. All of these things, they take time. And so 
I, I can't do a lot of the things that I used to do. And that's a shame. But again, if you do it right, you, you get made up for in, in the sense that people will bring you deals, hopefully. And then you can get on the other side of it and say, okay, fine. I'm not going to underwrite a hundred deals, but I will look at 10 deals that people bring to me and I'll pick one of them. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think the point that I take away from that is that there's a balance to strike. We can't always be in doing podcasts, writing articles or right. underwriting deals. At a certain point, we have to get out there, walk the properties, interview the property managers, the stuff that that makes the deal real and is going to have an impact and kind of adds color and perspective to everything that we're doing. Because you obviously only get one side if you're looking at the underwriting, but you know whether the rubber meets the road is when you get out there and you see the property and you're like, oh, wow, they did amazing things with those pictures. And it's not exactly as nice as I thought it was, whatever the case may be. Hopefully it's right. the other way around, but you get my point. There's that balance that has to be struck for sure. Right. Exactly. Like the mom and pop deal where they really didn't make enough of it. Don't even have a broker involved in the deal and selling it for less than it's worth because quite frankly, they didn't put in the work to optimize it. Yep. All right. This has been an awesome conversation, but we do need to move into the turbo round. All right. I'm going to ask you three questions that I ask every guest that comes on my show. And I just ask you for a quick, honest answer. First question is, what is one red flag every investor should look out for? And that could be either an active or a passive investor. So I would say partners. If you're an active investor, partners will make or break your deal. And if you're a passive investor, guess what? You may think, gosh, I don't have to worry about that. But you do. Has this group done a deal together? Have the individuals done deals successfully in the past? Not just the track record of the individuals, but has the group worked together? This is something that's valuable to know. No, that's a good one. And one that I haven't heard, but I can vouch personally that it's true. We say to look at the experience of the entire group and take that into account, but you're right. How well that group works together or at least having evidence or experience having worked together can make a big difference. Yeah, and I wouldn't say no to the deal necessarily, but it's definitely a plus if you've seen that particular team or at least the lead sponsors working well together through one, two, three, or four deals. Yeah, absolutely. All right, what is a myth about this business that you would like to set straight? That you don't really need to understand finance or macroeconomics, you do. And so by doing it, you'll become a much better investor. Go read The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. That's a great start. Yeah, you don't have to like it, but you need to understand it. I've read that <laughs> book probably five or six times, at least, cover to cover. Nice. All right. And finally, what does success look like to you? To me, it's time freedom. I have a lot of it, but I'd like more of it. And at some point I could say, I'm done doing deals. I'm going to run the deals I have, and we're going to return our shareholders capital. That's what success looks like to me. Yeah, definitely something we hear time and time again, that, that freedom of time. All right. Hey, George, this has been amazing. Please tell our guests how they can get a hold of you and if there's anything else that you would like to share with them. Sure. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm very prodigious. So follow me, send me a message, reach out. You can also find me, at least for the time being, at Horizon Multifamily, George at horizonmultifamily.com. And in the future, I will at some point, slow roll, we're getting out Robert's Capital Enterprises. I've had that business operating for some time. And it may be time to bring that out from the shadows and make that my main entity. So in the meantime, LinkedIn may be the very best place to find me. All right. And we'll definitely have all the links to your socials and recommendations out on the show notes. All right. So again, George, thanks for coming on. Definitely appreciate you sharing your insights and your unique perspective with your background. And I look forward to seeing you continue to do big things on your journey to multifamily millions. Thank you, Tim. I love your podcast and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to your audience. All right. Thank you.